everyone. A very good evening. You're watching The Money Show on ET Now. This is your daily dose of one hour of personal finances. I'm Mubina Kapasi and let's tell you what we have lined up on today's episode of the show. Um, first up, it's you know the first of the month, a brand new month, and I'm hoping that a lot of you guys have received you know your salaries or your um, you know monthly incomes that you do usually tend to get at the beginning of every month or at the end of the previous month. Be that as it may, it's important that you don't simply spend away the salary. Although, mind you, in this um, you know largely social distancing measures that we're all practicing, I'm hoping that. Or rather, there aren't much avenues where you know we can at this point of time spend our money. Uh, but nevertheless, online shopping still can be a very, very um, you know enticing lure. So yeah, how exactly should you efficiently utilize this newly received monthly income or salary? That's what we will be talking about on today's episode of the Money Show. We'll also be talking about how salaries itself have changed. Have people got a hike this year? Are you the only one who's not got any hikes? And also, how can you judge if your company will be able to give you a hike in the next year? Basically, if all the efforts that you're putting in is simply coming to nowhere, where you know companies are not even being able to cover the inflation that takes place every year. You know, should you essentially consider moving on perhaps to another job? Deloitte has a very interesting report on all of these pointers. We'll be getting on board, uh, you know, the partner of Deloitte, Mr. Ghosh. And finally, on the show, we'll be discussing the sovereign gold bond scheme. The latest tranche is live for subscription. Should you subscribe for it? That's the question that we will get uh, to answering. So we have with us Mrin Agarwal joining in on the show. Uh, Mrin, a pleasure having you with us. Thank you for joining us today on The Money Show. So to start with, like I mentioned, right, it's the first of the month and a lot of us have got that salary or any other form of income, could be rental income, uh, you know, that must have got credited to our bank account. And, um, you, you know, how would you say efficiently one should utilize this money so that, you know, you're not left with that end of month syndrome where, you know, you've got, you've got barely any money left in your bank account or your wallet? Well, <clears throat> as always, uh, nice to be here today on The Money Show, Mobila. And uh, as far as your salary is concerned, well, I think the first thing is to really uh, set aside some amount of money for expenses, set aside some amount of money for savings. And of course, it doesn't have to be, you know, to the last uh, paise, but uh, have a clear demarcation in terms of your spending amount and your saving amount. That's point number one. Um, secondly, of course, now being the sixth month of the lockdown, I think, you know, all of us are in this thing that we really want to spend money somehow or the other. And if we cannot get out and spend it, then why not just spend it on e-com websites? So I think, you know, we have to keep some of those urges aside. Of course, I have always advocated having a discretionary spending plan because let's understand that while we have our essential expenses, we all need discretionary expenses for having fun. So always budget in an amount for discretionary expenses. Um, I think one of the things that you should not be doing is certainly taking Insta loans because nowadays loans are very, very easily available. And we have this tendency to just go out and take them for every small little thing. So I think, you know, these are some of the things that um, you need to be doing essentially what it means is that you need to be following a budget. Okay, so yeah, creating that budget is extremely important. But how can you know, Mrin, uh, where do you sort of start off if somebody you know, uh, inspired, of course, listening to you, and if they want to ensure they stick to this budget from the first of every month, and when better than to start off now, right? So, how do you essentially? suggest they start off in creating a budget so we advocate the 30 30 40 rule which is 30 percent expenses 30 percent emi and 40 percent savings i know it can be a little tough because 40 percent savings is not easy to do but what i would suggest is that if let's say you, you know you're taking home 100 rupees so out of that every 100 rupees that you take home, you keep aside 60 rupees towards expenses and keep aside 40 towards savings. And, you know, even if you can't get to the 40 number, if you're starting off with 25, 30%, that itself is a good start. But obviously, you do need to start looking at working towards the 40% uh, number. Um, I think keeping a track of expenses, and there are a lot of expense apps out there that you can use or 
you can just use a simple excel and again as i said you don't really need to get it down to the last decimal you know i mean as long as you have a fair idea that these are the amounts of money that i'm spending on essentials these are the amount of money that i'm spending on non essentials i think you should be good to go and it it really just is this habit of having this financial decision uh, discipline to say that i'm going to ensure that i save this x amount of money every month uh, irrespective of what happens so if it means saying no to certain things then so be it you know identifying essential expenses this is really the tricky part right um many times we get this question that you know i have emis etc as well to pay and you know when you add emi into expenses it's finished right because sometimes your emi amounts to are extremely large so uh, does that as well come under the bracket of essential expenses i mean what all would you consider under essential i'm sure food and shelter will be prime food shelter transportation your subscriptions um any other sort of rentals for example right so uh, all of these would be ass- your essentials and of course you have uh, the emis as well which is sort of become part of essential expenses now especially if it's emi towards home uh, it is certainly part of your essential expenses obligatory payments that includes emis towards home loans uh, you know car loans or any other kind of obligatory expense is an essential expense no two doubts about that okay um now you know you you mentioned the 40 30 30 rule right so uh, let's talk about that a little more um investments um, you know is around 30% of your uh, expenses so uh, within the entire investment bit as well um, what all do we cover over here i mean do we cover my sip do we cover ppf what investment do we cover fixed deposits as well yes absolutely anything that you're saving money for into so it's your fixed deposits it's your ppf your mutual funds nps anything that you're investing for your future is included in the um investments part of the 30 30 40 or the 40% of the budget okay understood uh great all right so there you have it that should be pretty simple uh, you know very simple 40 30 30 rule uh, that you can essentially follow and um, you know that should sort of at least help you set out on the path of budgeting uh, so that you know you're not left uh, floundering for cash um, you know when you have to um, when when it comes down to essentially uh, uh you know properly spending the money uh and yeah that's essentially the simple rule um Okay, let's talk then more about investment, or rather, let's talk about uh, the the balance thirty which you mentioned. Um, you know, we say that's essentially used for uh, for emergency expenses as well. We spoke about forty; that's your expenses. We spoke about thirty; that will be the investments. Uh, so, the balance thirty, um, um, Rin, uh, would be. I mean, how do you suggest that essentially is spent? I mean, it, as far as possible, do you think it's better off it's put in an emergency fund, or do you think it's okay if people, you know, sort of use that for their other discretionary spends? so um i think um you know as i said 30% towards expenses which is your total expenses which is your essential and non essential and i actually said 30% towards emis because i think emi is like a really large component uh, today now with respect to your question in terms of discretionary expenses um it's it's really for the individual to figure out you know ki what is going to be left after essential expenses what is going to be left for discretionary expenses but you know what happens is that when you do this sort of an exercise you can actually get a fair idea you know of what your expenses are the other bit is also you know from the 40% that i said for savings now there may be situations where you're not able to save that 40% right because of various reasons you might have maybe a high amount of loans so actually you know on the 40% also uh you could also try to see if you have a lot of loans and you want to try to become debt free then maybe it's a good idea to uh use some part of that to actually pay off some of your loans especially if it's like these personal loans or these 
insta loan or if you've got like credit card loans then you know maybe it's a good idea to kind of pay off these loans because they're all at very high interest rates and maybe your money is not going to be able to generate those sort of returns um on discretionary expenses i really think that they should be capped at maybe 15% of the overall expenses Fifteen percent of overall expenses—that essentially uh, should be your your discretionary expense. Uh, don't sort of extend it beyond that. Okay, uh, that thirty bracket. Let's delve a little more in that because you know, even though it's just a thirty percent bracket, bracket and not the majority, many a times people need the most guidance on that, right, Marin? So if somebody, let's say, has just received their salary, they've not been investing, but now they want to start investing, how do you recommend? Um, you know, they go about their entire bit. Um, where should they start off especially for those people who've not get invested money in the market or in any you know asset for that matter so two things uh, first and foremost uh, build up the emergency cash which is 3 to 6 months of your expenses um you can do it slowly you don't it's not like the immediate 30% you put everything into the emergency fund but start building the emergency fund the other thing is also to look at investing for other financial goals so you might be wanting to buy a vehicle or you might be wanting to buy a car or you might be wanting to even save for retirement uh so start investing some amounts of money for some of these financial goals and i think automating expenses really helps you know in 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 kind of ensuring that that the investments happen on a regular basis rather than you know the money getting credited and then you going and making the investment every month i think automating investments is a good way to ensure that those monies get invested and those amounts are really not lying in your savings account to get used up for expenses all right okay and within uh, essentially uh, the entire investment bracket uh, you know people you, you, the traditional investment modes are fixed deposits and ppfs and many time people think okay you know that's about it because you know i have my ppf which also serves as a tax you know for, for, as a tax instrument and fixed deposits because well you know it's one of the most popular products in india um, the safest as well right given the current environment um, so how do you essentially get them to sort of change that mindset and if fixed deposits and ppfs are already done um, then how do you you know want them to essentially go about with the balance money I think if it's um, certainly people need to have some amount of equity exposure, and gone are the days where you can actually just plan for your financial goals with PPF and fixed deposits, given the fact that the returns are falling on both of these instruments. So uh, certainly people need to take some amount of risk, and I would suggest that they would they should start off an SIP. Uh, if they're really unsure about which fund to go with, you can always go with an index fund. It's low cost. um easy to track you don't have to worry about um you know what the active fund management part of it am i choosing the right fund not choosing the right fund right so it's like a no brainer fund that you can really start off your investment with you can also start with a multi cap fund because again that's a good diversified fund to uh, start investing your money in so certainly i would say take some amount of equity exposure if you're only doing traditional investments you need to bump up your portfolio by taking some amount of equity exposure which is going to give you a, a better return over the longer term all right well there you have it uh... uh that's um you know mrin agarwal talking about uh, essentially how you can go about starting your investment um and you know essentially how uh, you as well uh, can go about with your investment journey a ppf and fd as we know is obviously not enough uh, you need to make some equity investments as well because do remember we have inflation um that's really eating into a lot of our returns in fact even if you look at fixed deposits um you know this is something that uh will uh you know not be able to cover the rising expenses which is being reflected through inflation by the way mrin you know since i have you i would like to take in your opinion on the news that we received yesterday and uh that is with respect to um the gdp now you know when when people see the number like this and that's gdp uh, it definitely does scare them quite a bit because uh you know um, 
you say that look I'm investing in India's equity story but then you have GDP which is declining 24 uh, percent that's almost a recessionary kind of view right so what's your uh, you know view your opinion to all these worried viewers well for those who have already invested I would just say if nothing has changed with respect to your goal uh, remain invested because also I know the number came much worse than what was expected but at the end of the day we, we all saw what we had gone through with the extreme lockdown and it's not surprising that uh, uh, that this sort of a number came out. Yes, it's worrisome certainly, but I think um, in the long term and again, if you do have a long term investment horizon and nothing has changed with respect to your financial goal, I think you should just stick through it right now and not get very perturbed by, the, by this number. Um, certainly, it is going to be a difficult time probably for the next couple of quarters. Uh, given all the uncertainty that we're seeing around COVID. But I think the long-term prospects of India still are very good. For those who are wanting to invest right now and who are confused and thinking, should I wait it out or what should I do? Well, you could always start investing. Uh, again, very important if you're doing equities, you do need to have a 10-year time frame. Uh, but you could start investing in tranches is what I would recommend. Um, and honestly, it's very difficult to time the markets. It's very difficult to know when the markets are going to fall and stuff like that. So I would just say that try to just, you know, break it maybe into four or five tranches, your investment uh, to really protect, do some bit of risk protection. All right. Uh, so, but do you, exp do you recommend they do any tactical changes? Like, for example, perhaps increase, you know, their cash exposure or anything like that? Um, honestly, you know, see, for people who uh, are investing for their goals and they're really nowhere towards it, I don't, I don't recommend any changes like that. But yes, uh, and, and you know, Mubina, this is where I find that, you know, as far as individual investors are concerned, they actually find it very difficult to implement a core and tactical strategy because what happens is that as a retail investor, I'm not really sure right now if the markets are going to go up further or if there's going to be like a big crash and stuff like that. So I always advise that, you know, as far as individual investors are concerned, I think uh, they should just, you know, remain invested as per their goals. But certainly people who do have core and tactical allocation portfolios could look at maybe uh, taking some money off at this point in time and and remaining in cash but those would be the more suave investors who are taking uh, tactical allocations okay so i essentially for long term investors you don't really need to worry um, you know, because your your goal is still far away, so you have time. So these um, all these crises essentially should not really worry you. And yes, we are you know sort of in the midst of a crisis, right? Because of the COVID pandemic, and that's being reflected in the GDP number as well. Hopefully, of course, for the September quarter, the GDP number will pick up. There will be um, uh, you know, and, and fingers crossed, really, because the PMI number did show an uptick of 52. So that indicates that yes, slowly but steadily, manufacturing is picking up. But yeah, nevertheless, again, you know, uh, we know this is, it's not just India, it's its a blip that everybody is facing worldwide. So yeah, not too much of a worry. Uh, but again, it's something that you must keep note of. Okay, let's quickly take on board our questions and queries. First up, we have Saroj Kumar. He writes, I've invested money in Motilal Oswal Multicap over the last two, three years. Now he wants to know that the game, gain is not that great, especially when you compare it to other multi-cap funds. So should he redeem or wait for some more time? Well, I think he should wait because, you know, he's only invested for two to three years. And most funds actually go through these phases or cycles. As far as Motilal is concerned, I actually recommend that fund because I uh, find that they have like a good strategy in terms of stock selection and they do more of like long-term investing. So uh, certainly the, the portfolio is a little bit more concentrated as compared to maybe some of the other multi-cap portfolios. But I would say that please remain invested and funds do go through cycles. And I do think that in the long term, the fund will be.
right. Uh, so there you have it. That's the word of advice coming in from uh, Mrin for Saroj. Uh, you know, do take note of what she is uh, essentially, uh, you know, saying when it comes to Motilal Oswal Multi Cap Fund 35, Multi Cap 35 Fund. And in fact, for all our viewers. Okay, let's take on board our next query. Adi Sharma says, I'm 23 years old and my investment time period will be around 20 years. Uh, so clearly long-term investor, but um, here's the amazing part. He started his mutual fund investment around two years ago. The investment is done for the purpose of wealth creation to be used at the time of uh, retirement. Uh, this is my current portfolio, all SIPs and direct growth options. So very confident young man. HDFC balanced advantage, Murray asset emerging blue chip, access growth opportunities. Uh, so it's roughly about a thousand, around a four, three thousand five hundred rupee SIP, largely a modest amount. Now he wants to start another SIP, and uh, he wants to know if he should include a large cap fund or a debt fund for the long term. Okay, so he started off at 21. Um, that's a great age to start off. We always say the earlier the better because you have this wonderful thing called the power of compounding that kicks in. What's your view on this, uh, on his portfolio, Mrin? Uh, he's got a very long term to go, uh, you know, and you see he may be young, so maybe his income as well may be a little lower. But he started off on the right note. What's your view on how he should go about? Well, firstly, I would, I find it commendable that, you know, he started investing at the age of 21. So, uh, that's really nice to know. Um, secondly, uh, he's looked at a balanced fund and I think he's looked at some large and mid cap funds. Uh, given his age and given the fact that he said that it's for his retirement, I certainly think that he should take some amount of mid cap or even small cap exposure uh, in his portfolio and not stick to large cap. So this large cap bias may also be because of what we've seen in the last two years where large caps have done well. But given the long-term nature of holding, he should certainly include, include some mid-cap and some small-cap fund. Uh, as far as investing into a debt fund, I mean, that really depends upon what his risk profile is and if he wants to take debt exposure at this point in time. So that's the question he'll have to ask himself that, do I want to be entirely in equity or do I want to have some debt exposure as well? And if you, there's no harm in having a debt exposure for retirement. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but uh, the first thing he needs to ask himself is that does he want to have that and if yes then I would say that go with short-term debt funds because I have found that the risk adjusted returns in short-term debt funds are far better than um, uh, dynamic bond funds or the longer duration funds that exist so I would recommend either do the short-term debt fund and if you don't want the debt exposure then go with a mid cap or a small cap fund. Okay, so perhaps a short-term debt fund would essentially work and uh, that's what the recommendation coming in from Mrin. All right, let's take on board another query. We have V. Rao writing, I've been investing varying amounts in mutual funds through SIP in 2011. Currently, he's investing a lakh and a half uh, uh, per month. So it's, it's quite a, a good amount that he's investing. And as on 31st March 2019, that's last year, uh, his investment was 62 and a half lakhs. Um, it came to 80 lakh rupees. And then of course, it fell to 63 lakhs, I'm assuming because of the entire, uh, you know, lockdown in the market. So um, his questions are, uh, the, you know, the, the signs of recovery are a little bleak. Uh, according to him, that is, of course, he wants to know if he should redeem his funds, um, uh, you know, the ones that are currently lying and should he again start a fresh SIP um, and reinvest the redeemed money when things start looking up later. Uh, secondly, he wants to know about his investments. So he's got around 10 funds uh, across, you know, there's ICICI approved value discovery, SBI blue chip, ABSL equity, Motila Loswal focus 35. Uh, Tata Balance, Murray Asset Large Cap, Murray Emerging Equity, DSP Small Cap, Canra, Canra Rebecca Emerging, UTI Mid Cap and Franklin Focused Equity. So 10 funds, what's your opinion, Rin? Too many or um, you know, do you think they're okay? Unfortunately, he's not written his time horizon, but he's been investing all the way since 2011. So what's your view? Well, I can certainly understand that he's extremely worried about his investments, but honestly, it's very difficult to time the markets and um, it's very difficult to say where the markets are going to go. So, and also, you know, this strategy of exiting and then waiting and entering and all, 
we've seen it in the past that you can never catch the markets and you can never get the timing right so um certainly he'll just have to hold on um secondly in terms of the funds i think there are too many funds i mean having 10 funds is like just too many um and again like some of the funds there would be an overlap like for example mere asset large cap and mere emerging equities fund there would be a high amount of large cap considering that one is a large cap and the other is a large in a mid cap fund uh there would be a huge amount of overlap there again focus funds have more concentrated risk so i think he should really bring down his number of funds to five funds and stick with those and probably uh, given his age you know stick with the large cap and the multi cap exposure essentially and then decide between small and mid cap which one he wants to have but ideally i would say that just stick with the large cap and the multi cap exposure in the portfolio and bring down the number of funds bring down the number of funds um that's one advice because 10 funds perhaps is a little too much you know in fact mrin as well does uh, say that look one fund already gives you exposure to you know a good amount of stocks and then you have 10 funds like that you know so there is bound to be a lot of overlapping so it's just uh, over over diversification and it's really not necessary plus it's a logistical nightmare as well to keep track of how each and every fund is doing um you know when you do your annual or semi annual uh, investment portfolio review Okay well um Rin on that note we let you go so thank you so much for joining us today on the money show it's all, uh, it's always a pleasure but actually Rin uh, we are going to get you right back um, after this very short break that we will take cuz we want to discuss sovereign gold bonds as well with you so stay with us um and folks before we take a break uh, remember there have been changes uh, when it comes to the margin pledge system uh, this is something that will impact all of you who have been indulging in some you know share trading especially during this lockdown and i know it's a whole host of you because you know there have been a surge in demat accounts open many people have been looking at this rebound in the markets and they've been tempted really to put in a trade or two in the equity market so here's how essentially uh, you know these margin pledge systems will affect your trading uh, my colleague jayesh khilnani joins us with an explainer and what sebi has done is uh, they have created a new system which in which uh, you know it is called as the pledge and re pledge uh, system for the margin collection uh, essentially what it means is uh, despite the client giving a power of attorney uh to uh, the uh, broker you know you the client will still have to pledge on an individual basis so you know uh, that poa will actually become uh, a little redundant as far as the pledging and repledging of shares is concerned now why is this done is uh, because uh, sebi has implemented a rule saying that uh, you know even uh, the cash segment uh, trading or investing that will require an upfront margin of as much as 20% when it comes to buying and selling of securities so that is the reason i know they are saying that uh, one can also pledge their shares uh, also what what this will actually do is uh, a lot of uh, btst trades uh, will be discouraged as well as uh, you know you will not be able to use the proceeds of uh, any of the share sale that you have made today to buy another security till the actual amount is credited in the client account as well so that's the hindrance that the market is working with also the feedback that i have received from a lot of uh, brokers is that a lot of uh, small time brokers will get impacted because the, uh, they have not been ready as far as uh, the technical requirement is concerned for this particular system to be implemented however uh, i do not see any feedback coming in of the same sort from the larger brokers uh, that we have in the country uh some of the pros and cons that i have received from the market is of course starting off uh, with the cons is that uh, you know this will actually put a lid on the broader market uh, buzzing stock that we saw uh of late you saw in the last one month that you know there had been a lot of high beta names that had been gaining so it will actually put a lid on those gains as well also it is likely to reduce uh, the trading volume activity uh, so that will be a dampener and the stt would in turn get impacted uh, so you know lesser revenue as well from the stt front um, as far as the advantages are concerned what the regulator is actually aiming to do is reduce the speculation that we have in the market along with uh, you know reduction in the misuse of the client securities that are done in the pool account All right Jayesh thanks so much for that uh, explainer on that note we will take a very short break right here on the show don't go anywhere